And I'm going to ask everybody here today to go ahead and turn in your Bibles or your handheld devices to Isaiah 9. That'll be our focus scripture for today. While you're turning there, I want to tell you a story about uh, the, the sermon today. It's part of a sermon series entitled, How Jesus Changed the World. And today we're looking at the subject of how Jesus changes nations. And I want to begin this message by telling you a story about David Silverman. Many of you have heard his name before. He was the head of American Atheists, and he's a particularly bombastic and kind of in your faith face atheist as he rails against Christians and churches and anything religious. One day I moderated a debate between, between David Silverman and Alex McFarland, who at that time was the president of Southern Evangelical Seminary, and I was the moderator of that debate. And so before the debate, we all went out to dinner. And I begin to make the point that besides the philosophical arguments for the existence of Christ, the biblical arguments for the existence of Christ, the philosophical arguments for the existence of Christ, that, that possibly some of our strongest arguments are the effects of Jesus on the world. Like last week, our dating system, um, charities, hospitals, universities, practically everything good comes from Jesus in our world today. And then I mentioned the effect of Jesus upon nations. Nations tend to prosper and decline in direct proportion of their allegiance to Jesus Christ. Nations that follow Christ prosper. Nations that abandon Jesus decline. And David Silverman, this famous atheist, challenged me on that. He said, oh, the Scandinavian countries, they're completely secular, but they're some of the most prosperous, peaceful, and unified countries in the world. And I said to him, oh, the Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Norway, aren't those the countries with all the crosses on their flags? Folks, Jesus changes nations. As countries embrace Christ, they become more peaceful and prosperous. And take those Scandinavian countries, for example. They were the countries of the Vikings. If you remember, the cruel and warlike Vikings. And they worshipped the Norse gods who were also, guess what, cruel and warlike. But about seven or 800 A.D., Christian missionaries from England and France began to take missionary tours into the Viking lands. The Word of God took hold on the Vikings' lives. And by the year 1050, a vast majority of this once marauding band of savages were now Christians. They were baptized, went to church, and proclaimed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Jesus changes nations. I told you last week about England during the Elizabethan era and their enjoyment of cruelty, bear baiting, dog fights, cock fights where, they would, where animals would fight to the death. Hangings were public events. People were tortured and burned at the stake. But then in the Victorian era, a spiritual revival swept across the British Empire and almost overnight, blood sport was eliminated. Slavery was abolished. Children and women were protected and society grew more compassionate and caring. And then the Roman Empire last week, I told you about, they turned to Christ and the gladiatorial game soon became a thing of the past. Jesus changes nations. I told you this last week, our, our nation's founding documents are theological doc documents. All men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jesus changes nations. Even communism can't stop the spread of Christianity. In the early 1900s, there were about 3 to 4 million believers in China. Then in 1949, the communists made Christianity illegal. They killed the preachers. They burned the churches, thinking they would eliminate Christianity. But the Bible uh, talks about how, how uh, these martyrs are the heroes of the faith. And, uh, and then in, in, in Fox's Book of Martyrs uh, uh, years ago, uh, it said the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And today in China, even under atheistic communism, there are over 100 million Christians who name the name of Jesus. Jesus changes nations. The converse is true, though, also. Uh, as nations embrace Jesus, they prosper, but nations that abandon Jesus soon begin to decline, and we're beginning to see this in our nation. Now, I'm not talking about governments. If you remember, China's government was, uh, was um, 
was, uh, was officially atheistic. But I want to tell you, the government screws things up so bad, the best thing our nation could do is be officially atheistic, and the government would screw it up so bad, we'd have a revival in the world. But, but um, it's, so it's not just governments I'm talking about. I'm talking about people coming to Christ. As the Chinese came to Christ, as Americans came to Christ, Nations prosper. As they leave the Lord, they begin to decline. So as we abandon Jesus Christ, the decline comes. The nation of Israel thought they were immune from God's judgment because they were his chosen people. Oh, he would never let his temple be destroyed. And in Jeremiah, they would cry, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord will save us. But their continued abandonment of the Lord resulted in that exalted temple being destroyed and them being taken into captivity. As nations embrace Christ, they prosper. As nations abandon Jesus Christ, they decline. And our nation is in trouble. 50 million abortions, most for convenience. And you think our nation will not be judged. All the violence, injustice, racism, pornography... Crude movies, TV shows, crime running rampant, and you think our nation will not be judged. All of the non-Christians, the former Christians, the idle Christians, the hypocritical Christians, the lackadaisical Christians, the backslidden Christians, the nominal Christians, the fake Christians, the lukewarm Christians, and you don't think our nation will be judged as he did with Sodom and Gomorrah, as he did even with Israel when they abandoned God, God's hand may be moving right now in heaven to release vengeance and judgment as our nation abandons his name. But I've got good news for you. We don't have any problem in our nation that a revival can't solve. There's hope. Unto us, a child has been born. And you can read about that in our focus scripture for today. And we're going to work through this passage verse by verse. Beginning with verse 2, we read, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So notice here that God brings light to nations. God brings light to nations. In 1905, a college student, Evan Roberts, from the nation of Wales, Wales was full of really crude, poor, uh, just coal miners. But he saw the light. He went forward at a worship service and prayed at the altar, Oh God, bend me. And upon his return to college, he kept hearing a voice that kept telling him to go back to his home church and speak to the young people there about the Lord. So he went back to his home in Lawfer, Wales, and announced to the pastor, I've come to preach. Y'all don't do that some Sunday morning, whatever. But announced to the pastor, I've come to preach. We had, that happened one time. We had a man that came in church. I'd never seen him before. He came up and he said, the Lord told me I'm going to preach today. He said, I said, man, that's awesome. When the Lord tells me that, I'm going to let you preach. It sounds exciting. But, um, but, but he, he goes home, I've got a word from God, and, uh, and uh, I want to, to preach. Well, the pastor didn't let him preach at the prayer meeting, but at the end of the service, he said, our young brother, Evan Roberts, feels like he has a message for you if you care to wait. Seventeen people waited, and Evan Roberts began with these simple words, I have a message for you from God. You must confess any known sin to God. And you must put any wrong done to others right. Second, you must put away any doubtful habit. And third, you must obey the Spirit promptly. Finally, you must confess your faith in Christ publicly. You know how we always talk about baptism, your public profession of faith. The things I make public, I'm more serious about. And that was his message. All 17 participants responded yes to that invitation, confessing their sins, saying, yeah, I'm a Christian, I say that publicly. The pastor was so pleased that he asked Evan to continue to preach all week. Then he was asked to preach another week, and then revival came. 
We don't know all the details of the Welch revivals, but you can look at old newspaper articles from Wales, and suddenly all the dull articles on the church page begin to change. There are articles like this, great crowds of people drawn to Loffer, Wales. Another one, the main roads between Lelaney and Swansea are packed with people trying to go to church. Shopkeepers advised that they were closing early to find a place at church for a prayer meeting. Confession services, healing services, singing services, worship services, revivals each evening. One reporter was sent down to cover a local revival service in the newspaper. We have these newspapers and from, the, from 1905, 1906, and he describes a strange meeting that went on until 425 in the morning. And even then, people did not seem willing to go home. Another newspaper reported, on Sundays, every church is filled. The movement went like a tidal wave over Wales. In many cities, the judges had no cases to try. No robberies, no burglaries, no murders, no embezzlements, nothing. As the revival swept Wales, drunkenness was cut in half. The nation prospered as Jesus took hold. There was a temporary slowdown in the production of the coal mines. And the only thing people could figure out was the little horses that pulled the mine carts could not understand what was being said to them without curse words. And so they had to take a few months to relearn the commands without the foul language. The government reported that at that time, within a year of the beginning of the revival, there were radical changes in the divorce rates, in the out-of-wedlock births, in domestic abuse cases, murders, thefts, even civil cases. Why? Because God brings light to nations as they embrace him. Oh, I could tell two hours worth of stories from the Welch revival. But then secondly now, God brings also not only light to nations, he brings victory to nations. In verse 3 of our passage, we read, you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of the harvest as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire." In other words, there's going to be peace and victory in the land. About five years ago, I cobbled together some information from some primary sources on a Christian message about five years ago that I preached here that I entitled Patton's Prayer. How many of you remember George Patton's Prayer? I put it on my Facebook page a few days ago. There's no time to tell you the whole story, but the short version is this. In 1944, the Allied forces invaded Europe on D-Day. One fine, final big effort to get to Germany. They landed in June on Normandy. Over 425,000 troops were killed. The problem is six months later they were still bogged down in France because of continuous torrential rainfall. As many grew sick from the rain as had died at Normandy. General Patton, the general of the Third Army, was beside himself with worry. Now, he's a crude, foul-mouthed general, but, but he was a student of war. And no one had planned any better than him. No one had strategized better. No one motivated the troops to execute better. But wars are sometimes won based on what Patton called the Third Realm. Things that you can't plan for and things that you can't work for. Things like the weather or a contagious disease can turn many a battle in history. And so this crude, egotistical, foul-mouthed General Patton began to realize his utter dependence upon the Lord. And he turned. One of his diaries from that time, one of the entries says this, I know of nothing more that I can do to prepare for this attack except to read the Bible and pray. So he starts realizing the weather, there are things that I cannot control. Only God, only God 
And so we have records of this, folks. So he telephones the head chaplain of the Third Army, the Reverend James O'Neill, the head chaplain. And according to Patton's deputy chief of staff, the phone call went like this. This is General Patton. Don't you have a good prayer for weather? We must do something about these rains if we are to win the war. Chaplain, I want you to publish a prayer for good weather. I'm tired of these soldiers having to fight mud and floods as well as the Germans. See if we can't get God on our side. Chaplain O'Neill responded, Sir, it's going to take a pretty thick prayer carpet for that kind of praying. General Patton, we have records of this. General Patton said, I don't care if it takes a flying carpet. I want the praying done. Chaplain O'Neill replied, yes, sir. And then he says, but may I say, General, that it usually isn't a customary thing among the men of my profession to pray for clear weather to kill their fellow man. General Patton, still on the same phone call, says, Chaplain, are you trying to teach me theology or are you the chaplain of the Third Army? My men are doing their duty. I want you to do your duty. I want a prayer. And after hanging up, James O'Neill, the chaplain of the Third Army, he composed an original prayer, which he typed on a three-by-five-inch card. And it goes like this. Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate rains with which we have had to contend. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us as soldiers who call upon thee that armed with thy power we may advance from victory to victory and crush the oppression and wickedness of our enemies and establish thy justice among men and nations. Patton had a field company that printed topographical maps for war. They totally, uh, they totally stopped printing the, the war maps and they, used, they converted that printing press to print 250,000 small cards with that prayer on it, enough for the whole Third Army to have one. It had the prayer on one side and because it was close to Christmas, General Patton had included a Christmas greeting for the troops on the other side. You can still order one of these old cards from 1944 on eBay. They cost about $50. But Patton also knew that a printed prayer, no matter how well composed, was no good unless people were really praying. And so he prepared a training letter and we still have that training letter today. It's called training letter number five. And it goes like this. At this stage of the operations, I would call upon the chaplains and the men of the third United States Army to focus their attention on the importance of prayer. Now, folks, this is an unstored. This is General Patton here. Focus your attention on the importance of prayer. Our glorious march from Normandy Beach across France to where we stand should convince the most skeptical soldier that God has ridden with our banner. Pestilence and famine have not touched us. We have continued unity of purpose. We have had no quitters. Our leadership has been masterful. That's his ego coming there. The Third Army has no roster of retreats, none of defeats. We have no memory of a lost battle to hand on to our children from this great campaign. But we are not stopping here. Tough days may be ahead of us, and it is our business to pray. We preach its importance. We urge its practice. But the time is now to intensify our faith in prayer. Gideon of the Bible. Now, um, Patton was a student of war. He had studied all the battles of the Bible, and so he's quoting a, a, kind of a, a battle here from the Bible. Gideon of, of Bible fame was least in his father's house. He came from Israel's smallest tribe, but he was a mighty man of valor. His strength lay not in his military might, but in his recognition of God's proper claims upon his life. He reduced his army from 32,000 to 300, lest the people of Israel would think that their valor had saved them. I love this next par paragraph. We have no intention to reduce our vast striking force, but we must urge 
instruct, indoctrinate every fighting man to pray as well as fight. In Gideon's day, as well as our own, now listen to this phrase. In Gideon's day, as well as our own, spiritually alert minorities carry the burdens and bring the victories. Will you be in this minority that prays? Then he says this, so pray, not only in church, but everywhere. Pray when driving, pray when fighting, pray alone, pray with others, pray by night and pray by day. Pray for the secession of these immoderate rains. Pray for good weather for battle. Pray for the defeat of our wicked enemy. Pray for victory. Pray for our army. And pray for peace. He continues this training letter. We must march together all out for God. Now is not the time to follow God from afar off. This army needs the assurance and the faith that God is with us. And with prayer, we cannot fail. Two days later, the U.S. armies were engaged in the greatest battle ever fought by American forces. The outcome of that battle and possibly the entire Allied war effort in Europe would turn on the weather that had basically been raining for just months. Patton's chief of staff, a Colonel Harkins, later wrote, whether it was the help of the divine guidance asked for in prayer or just the normal course of human events, we never knew. At any rate, on the 23rd of December, the day after the prayer was issued, the weather cleared and remained perfect for six days, just enough to allow the allies to deliver a crushing defeat for the enemy. A day later on Christmas Eve, the Allied forces basically crushed Germany and the war was won. Six more months of cleanup, but the war was won. General Patton, this cruel, foul-mouthed military man, did something right. He realized God brings victory to nations, only God. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of us being a nation of losers spiritually. I'm tired of our Christian warriors fighting and dying in the mud. I'm tired of Christians being persecuted and seeing no victories. I'm tired of divorce. I'm tired of addiction. I'm tired of cancer. I'm tired of empty and backslidden churches. I'm tired of dissension, despair, and apathy, especially when the Lord puts this simple formula before us. Nations who embrace God prosper. God brings victory to nations through prayer. And finally, God brings redemption to nations. And he does it through the birth of a child. In verse 6 of Isaiah 9, we read, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. The government will be on his shoulders. And every nation that embraces Jesus will prosper. This child, Jesus, is God incarnate. God came to earth to show us the way. And in verse 6 we read, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now there's only one problem with this na message. Nations can't come to Jesus corporately. Nations only come to Jesus one by one as individuals receive him. So like Patton, God says, do your duty, not only for yourself, but for your family, your community, your nation and your world. Receive Jesus. Embrace Jesus. And then do something that very few Christians in our country do anymore. That's give him your all. Give him your life. <laughs>